all right so okay so shall we uh, can we have the you know presentation who wants to present first can somebody give a review what you have done yesterday a quick review okay nessa has enjoyed the reading <laughs> good yes uh, learners please um, give a quick review of what we have done yesterday a very quick review a brief introduction or a brief review good morning everyone good morning miss um just before we continue i don't know if it's a problem with my computer but your volume is very low is anyone else experiencing this no we're i'm here clearly you have to log out and then log in that was happening to me as well maybe it's a internet okay. uh, rosan maybe it's a internet internet connectivity okay thank you okay so where is jacob June, you want to quickly give a review what we have done yesterday, Miss Lenny? Miss, I'm I'm uh, I'm supposed to do a presentation, so I think it's only fair that others have the opportunity to do that. Yes, yes, I want to. No, I'm asking June Lenny. June. June Lenny. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey. We got more than one. Oh, day. sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, no problem. Morning, everybody. Um, yesterday we wrap up um, cognitive um, cognitive psychology, and we went on to block two, which is um, theories of intelligence, G and S factors, and the model of the JP DAS. So we went through nature of intelligence. We talk about the theoretical this this um, definition of intelligence. We talk about um, Gardner's and. Um, eight nine um multiples of intelligence and we went on and on to complete that um block two of theories of intelligence okay okay great so can we who was the person who had present the nature of intelligence who was assigned this activity the nature of intelligence i think it was denisa yes no. denisa yes denisa can you do you want to start with the nature of intelligence Then is not audible. Do you want to reconnect? Is she audible to others? Not loud. It's kind of low, Miss. Okay, yes. Hello. Okay, meanwhile, we can have, uh, like, we can hear from others also who have read about the nature of intelligence, who will start the discussion. What do we think? What what are the key components of intelligence? Or what are the components? What are the elements of an, of, uh, an intelligent person or uh, of uh, the term intelligence? Come on, class. Good morning, good yes, good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning. Um, one would have uh, good reasoning. Um, they might be able to have good memory. They will be able to make good judgments. That's just to give a few. Okay, great. Uh, Samuel, can we hear from you? Yes, um, Miss. Good morning. From um, from the reading um, from the nature, um, it, it says that intelligence is described as an inner instrument which possesses wisdom, prudence, emotions, 
social values and relations. Uh, it is a hard, it is a hard um, thing to define um, fully what intelligence is, but there are different theories, but some which are overlapped will be like adaptation, um, problem solving, um, adapting to, to, to new knowledge, using previous knowledge to solve problems and so on. Excuse me, Miss. I'm ready. Can you see my screen? Yes, Denisa. Thank you, Sam. So we'll hear from Denisa. She has presented. She has started sharing the screen. Yes, Denisa, you can continue. Okay, so today, good morning, class. Good morning, uh, lecturer and Mr. I remember his name. Well, today I'll be sharing on nature of intelligence <clears throat> on the three topics, three main topics that is on the handout. What is intelligence, the factors of intelligence, the elements of intelligence, and the history of psychological testing. <clears throat> so, in 19, 1921, there was a symposium held for psychological experts to define what intelligence is, because intelligence is hard to define. So, <clears throat> at the symposium, the different psychologists, they came up with different definition for what psych, uh, what intelligence is. Two of those definitions are, one, an individual is intelligent in proportion as he is able to carry on abstract thinking. This was done, this was done by Thurman, 1921. And intelligence, that is to say reasoning, judgment, memory, and power of abstraction. This was by Binet in 1992 and cited in Sacker, 1988. <clears throat> However, a man by the name of Boring in 1923, he operationally defined intelligence as intelligence is what intelligence best measures. An operational definition is a definition that would say, well, this is how you go about doing something. So in other words, there is no true definition for intelligence. However, the intelligence, the operational definition tells us where to start and that is by performing some kind of intelligence test. Next slide is the factors of intelligence. There was a, the, a survey carried out by Sinderman and Ruffman in 1987, where 1,000 experts were invited and they, they gathered some data that would describe what intelligence entails. And they all unanimously ag agreed upon three key areas that intelligence must consist of. These three areas are adaptation, abstract thinking, and capacity to acquire knowledge. Adaptation is the ability to modify one's behavior to meet the environmental demands. Abstract thinking is, is that is pa pattern recognition, analyzing, synthesizing, and problem solving. And three, Capacity to acquire knowledge is the ability to acquire new information and learn through experience. How does this relate to my personal experience last night developing this, this presentation? Is that in adapting, I did the presentation through my phone on Microsoft. And then when I transferred it to my computer, my computer, my Microsoft license was expired. So now I had to adopt and do the presentation, edit the presentation on Google Docs, which was new to me. And to me, this entire thing showed that, that I had the ability to adapt to a different environment. I had, the, I had to solve a problem, which would comprise of abstract thinking. And then I learned how to use a new tool. So that was a, a capacity to acquire new knowledge. So that those are the main factors of intelligence. Lastly, the history of psychological testing, or, or as it is on the handout, the um, historical perspective on individual differences and human abilities, which in short terms is psychological testing. So Franklin, he is not a matter of psychological testing, psychological testing and individual differences. He invented the first psychological testing method, 
artificial intelligence and ability. He founded the first testing laboratory in London in 1882, where visitors would, were tested in a variety of areas, such as height, weight, breathing, or amongst other physical and sensory tests. Galton was of the belief that just like physical traits, psychological traits were hereditary. Then there was Alfred Bennett, he practically worked on intelligence testing in the opening of the 20th century when he was when he was commissioned by the French government to identify mentally de deficient children within the French schools. He then collaborated with Theodore Simon. Together, they completed the first psychological test in 1905, where 30 problems concerning children's ability to understand and reason with objects in their environment were tested. In 1908, Binet work with, Binet's work was revised and the highest level of, of a child that a child could perform was called the mental age. William, William Stern in, in 1914 suggests that that mental age be divided by chronological age, then multiplied by 100, and that became the intel, intelligence quotient that is now known as the IQ test. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Well done. Okay. Good job. Okay. Thank you, Dennis, for the presentation. Uh, so, yes, the nature of intelligence, we, when we talk about nature of intelligence, uh, we also need to look at the factors, what are the factors that uh, contributes to the nature of intelligence. And one of the most important point is the concept of adaptation, adjustment, you know, and uh, solving, able to solve high cognitive, higher cognitive abilities. So when we indulge into cognitive, higher cognitive abilities, uh, all the cognitive activities like thinking, problem solving, uh, adaptation, adjustment, uh, creativity, learning, memory, all these are the areas where you get indulged in uh, uh, in a different kind of higher cognitive activities. And all these are done with your intelligence. So that is why yesterday also I mentioned that we will also look into the concept of and the relationship between creativity and intelligence, intelligence and language, creativity and environment, environment and language. So all this we are going to read. And then uh, if you remember, we had talked about uh, the different theories of intelligence Spearman's theory was discussed yesterday. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, can somebody quickly summarize what uh, uh, Spearman's two factor theory says? Anyone? Just a quick summary. Okay. Um, Spearman's two factor theory dealt with the issue of a general factor in all the intelligence tests um, that were being conducted in his time. And um, he also discovered that there was a correlation or relationship between um, the various tests that resulted in what he would refer to as a G factor. And that the differences or the variations in that correlation he referred to it as the S factor, basically. Okay, great, Jacob. Yes. So he has talked about a specific intelligence that is verbal, mechanical, spatial, and numerical. So these are the four types of specific abilities or intelligence an individual will acquire. And general factor is something which is acquired by every individual. And this is uh, intelligence where everybody can acquire this, but the specific will be uh, acquired by individuals on to some to some extent in one of the areas or in one of the specific abilities, an individual will excel and the others some part of the intelligence uh, for the other specific, they would acquire it. So that's what um, the uh, Spearman's two-factor theory says. So yesterday, if you remember, we had talked about the critical evaluation or the critical appraisal. Uh, so you guys were, uh, you know, were assigned to discuss this. So I think, Jacob, uh, it was you who has taken the critical evaluation for uh, two-factor theory. So please go ahead. Unmute yourself. Jacob, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Having, having mentioned the basic premise of his, of his theory, um, I want to contextualize what the critics said, given the fact that this debate was ongoing and has been ongoing and is still ongoing as to how to define and measure intelligences. 
Um, in Guyana, we have a term we use, we, we, we use it mambo. Mambo simply means to be able to navigate or to get by in certain situations. And in that context, um, a lot of the criticisms that, that, that were, were leveled from Turndike, um, which I focus on primarily, were that um, Spearman did not, in his studies, he did, he did not look um, specifically at the, re the understanding the relationships. Rather, he, he specifically focused on the quantitative element using statistical tools, um, such as the correlations and so forth. And so Thorndike argued that they were, the, 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 the correlations between the variables were too small um, to measure the actual relationships between the variables that were responsible for a person's intelligences. Um, he even made a very profound statement which, in which he claimed, this is Thorndike, that there was actually no G factor, but rather it was a question of the commonality of the task in the task rather than the, 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 the commonality in individual intelligences. And I found that very astounding. Um, he said that basically um, the people's, the differences that were observed in intelligence tests were as a result of the, the ability, the different abilities of individuals to perform the task and the range of, 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 of tasks they were able to uh, perform. He further posited that um, intelligence is really a series of skills or talents um, that existed. Um, and as such, the, the correlation between those skills and tasks was, was a function of people's ability to perform those tasks. Um, that's pretty much a summary of how I understood Thorndike's criticisms of um, Spearman's uh, two-factor theory. However, I want to just make a statement based on what I've read in that it has been established, and I, I, I believe, based on my assessment, that Spearman's contribution to the understanding of intelligence and how we are, how, how we operate, was was very important. In fact, he brought some amount of organization in, in the use of mathematical models. And secondly, he brought a disciplined approach to the study of intelligence, measuring intelligence, so we can better understand it. And that has been conclusive. Thanks. OK, thank you, Jacob. So this was the uh, presentation. With the presentation. With the I mean, not Message presentation. What Jacob said. Sorry? Is it possible for me to add a little to what um, Jacob yes, would have yes, said? Yes, why not? Please. Yes. yes. Hmm. So for the same um, Spearman's two-factor theory, I did some research and hmm. um, based on the criticism. So hmm. the two-factor theory was also criticized because Spearman had only focused on the psychometric approach. So the, what they say psychometric approach, you're talking about the factor analysis technique to measure intelligence and he did not focus on cognition process related to intelligence so basically they're saying that he did not include various activities like perception and emotional and motor abilities exactly yeah so that is why this has led to the development of other theories so uh, like multiple intelligence of Howard Gardner multiple intelligence Thurston's theory of multiple intelligence you will find that yes because of this criticism other theories were able to develop new theories right? yes so it is yes, one of yes. the criticism great any other comments on uh, Thurston uh, two spare two, two factors theory by experiment um, also what was yes please um so i found that there was this british american psychologist named raymond cattell i don't know if i'm pronouncing right but yes. he was chairman yes. student and he criticized the two-factor intelligence theory because um so he argued that the nature of intelligence could be better understood by the concept of something called fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence so i didn't see that anywhere in the handout so I'll, um, so I went on and I um, read a little more on that. And they said that it's the amount 
of knowledge, experiences, skill that are accumulated in an individual's brain throughout his or her life, they refer to that, well, Cattell referred to that as fluid intelligence. And the ability to aptly understand and reason the available information or knowledge and learning new skill, skill, sorry, is also, can also fall under fluid intelligence. Oh, fluid intelligence, sorry. Now, he broke it down and he categorized the fluid intelligence and the crystallized intelligence. So, for on the fluid, he said that logic, reasoning, and problem solving would fall under that, whereas the crystallized, you would have vocabulary, knowledge, and skills. That's just a little of what I saw, which I didn't see in the handout, and I found a little intriguing. So, I made a note yeah. of and just share yes. it with us. Yes, uh, Shariza, you are absolutely correct. So this is also one of the theories of intelligence which we found. It's not in the handbook, but you can read them. So yes, Raman Bukhutan, he talked about the food intelligence and the crystallized intelligence. OK, Shariza, can you mute yourself? So yeah, so uh, yes, crystallized intelligence is there. And so this is how the theory, if you look at the history of intelligence, the development of different kind of uh, intelligence theory, everybody has provided an evidence to the, uh, I mean, a criticism to the previous one, and then they have developed their theories. So I think that is how it goes, even for Maslow's theory also. Now we have the self actualization Have you seen that pyramid? pyramid? Uh, physiological needs and then basic needs and then the last one is self-actualization but now we have transpersonal one of the theory that has been added to the uh, to the pyramid so uh, if you look at the history that's what i'm mentioning if you look at the theories of intelligence every every theory has been developed after it has been criticized previously and they have criticized not criticized a critical evaluation is given there's a difference between criticism and critical evaluation so we're not using the word criticism. We have to use the word critical evaluation. A critical evaluation has been given by the researchers, and then they have developed their own theories. right? So yes, uh, Shariza, you have mentioned that it's not in the syllabus, but still, we can talk about it. So fluid intelligence, it, uh, it comes with experience when we learn. So for example, when we were young, we would learn alphabets, small alphabets. But now we don't have to read a single alphabet and then make sentence. Now we can read sentences properly. right? So they're all product of fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence that comes with experience you know all the skills different kind of skills that we learn so yes it is also there and Raman B. Kettle he has also worked in the field of personality uh, we have different kind of personality questionnaire also which he has developed 16 pf you know uh, if you are well aware of this questionnaire you will study this in MPC 3 paper. So this is what uh, the critical evaluation of what we have to see in uh, payments to factor theory can we have some uh, yeah uh, who else what uh, was uh, there to discuss the critical evaluation for this theory good morning miss yes Janet. yes good morning all right miss um <clears throat> i'm supposed to be presenting on turnstone's theory okay yes please um, proceed but before i go into that i was going to say something just now as it relates to the um sparman's theory whereby mm -hmm. um although we didn't look at gardner right gardner he um he had his views about Sparman's theory, whereby he was saying that there was a variety of um, intelligence, right, um, which worked in a combination instead of just underlining it under on the one unit as according to Sparman, which was the G, the G factor, right? And he, he mentioned that um, with this, the children would be able to think uh, more critically, so they'll be able to solve problems um, instead of just uh, being on this knowledge base. You know, when there's knowledge, children, okay, what 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 is a uh, what is a factor, and the children will be able to answer right off the bat. But if the children are are equipped with the knowledge of what factor is, they can go into answering any question, whether it's comprehensive or application method. The child will be able to solve the problem as it relates to that. Yes, so, John. Yes. Um, yes, different. That is how uh, different criticism has been provided. I mean, critical evaluation has been provided by. Uh, the you know successor of the, the theories of intelligence. So we can have some discussion on the Thurston's critical evaluation. Can we have some discussion on uh, Thurston's critical evaluation of 
uh, Spearman's two factor theory. Who was there to present? Thurston or Thorndike, if whoever, whichever you want to present. Yes, I was asked to present on a uh, guard now. So maybe because mm -hmm. Yannet uh, raised, <laughs> because okay. Yannet uh, raised the Gardner's theory, maybe I could just go ahead. Okay, all yes, right. Please. So I think by now we're all off here with what he posited. Uh, he posited that intelligence is more than IQ. And then he saw, alluded to Alfred Benet's work. Uh, what Gardner said is, um, a high IQ in the absence of productivity does not equate to intelligence, right? It's like you mm -hmm. were telling us yesterday, we have to be able to apply what we're learning. Uh, we know mm -hmm. that some of our students, maybe they pass 20 CXCs. Uh, that's the exam we do in the Caribbean. But then at the end of that, they can't remember anything about, uh, let's say, physics or bio, if that's not their field, right? So mm -hmm. he said... Um, so he, he um, prior to 1999, and obviously he's fairly modern, I think he's still alive, he formulated a list of seven intelligences, which I think we are very aware of. And then in 1999, he added uh, the naturalist intelligence. And, um, and then later on, he talked about existential intelligence. intelligence. Right? Yes. So the main... Um, the critical analysis, uh, many psychologists, um, many, he said we shall use criticize, but many psychologists um, question his work. Let me use that. Um, and the fundamental criticism of the theory is that uh, each of the seven multiple intelligences is in fact a cognitive style rather than a standalone construct right so uh the critics are saying what he in fact he posited um are our styles of 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 the way we process things um Hunt, Hunt that uh criticized Gardner's theory on the ground that theory of multiple intelligence cannot be evaluated by the rigors of science until it is is made specific enough to generate measurable models so he said it, it's too broad what he's proposing is is too broad and um again in in stack i'm not sure i'm calling this word correctly remark that there are there are grounds for doubting that Gardner had identified different intelligences rather than different abilities. All right. So again, that was a fundamental criticism. Has he really come up with, with has he really identified multiple intelligences or just different abilities? Um, okay, so so other criticisms are that um the theory of, of, of multiple intelligence is not empirical, not being tested by science. It's it's in, incompatible with with the G heritability. Jacob reminded us of that. And environmental influences. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so however, hmm. however, despite despite um these criticisms the theory of multiple intelligences as posited by Gardner is very useful as uh miss pointed out just now especially in, in the classroom um we are accustomed to we are accustomed to um testing people's iq based on how strong they are uh, mathematically or um or or literally but because because um Gardner introduced the idea of yes other 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 intelligences teachers then need to 
teachers need to pay attention and and to to their students they need to tailor um work in the classroom to to meet each of you know each child's intelligence um so basically that is i'm not a teacher i'm a social worker and um for me i can apply this because not only for children but for adults too we can help people in terms of esteem building and so on what do you have you might think you have nothing you might think you're not smart but you know what are the things you can do what are your strengths all right so we can apply his theory despite the fact that there has been um there is a lot of an um critical analysis surrounding his work thank you yes thank you very much can i add to this can i add to um garden's theory of multiple um intelligence okay, class will go with the sequence i think we're breaking the sequence just a second so we had the critical evaluation by thorndike by thurston and uh, the last one was which theory we uh, we have to take one more right let uh, let's follow the sequence let's not break thompson's yes, theory so be presented yes. on um, transform but i'm not getting to print up my um, presentation yeah, please. Uh, let's follow the uh, criticism that was given by Thompson. And just one second, plus somebody is at the door. Just a second. Yes, sorry. Yeah, please. Who had to present the Thompson's theory of critical evaluation? Jeanne, miss, but I'm yes, not yes. getting of my presentation for you no, guys. No, no, yes, please start. Hmm. All right. Um, so I'll have to present without it because I'm not getting to do it. Now, basically, um, Tom Stone, his theory focused mainly on the primary mental ability, also known as the group factor. He states that intelligent activities are not an expression of the innumerable highly factor stated by um Thorndike. And he also further mentioned that the expression is neither a general factor that pervades the all the mental activities. Right now, he basically from the Sparman's, Sparman's um, theory where he mentioned the two factor, what Turnstone did was to um, elaborate a bit more on his G factor, gaining seven factors from that, which were the number factor, the verbal factor, spatial factor, perceptual speed, memory, word, influence factor, and reasoning factor, which all would be able to recognize when you see the children or people in the whole bringing out um, specific skills that they are better at um there was a, a, a bit of a conflict and this was stated stated by ekinson i don't know if i'm calling the, the name right 1972 he said that um for sparman they both had they both did um researches right but um they had a different way in going about doing it um first of all um sparman he used children from a population whereas Turnstone used students to develop his research. They both did testing, um, but the testing in which they did, Sparman focused on um, variant testing. He did his most of his tests wasn't um, giving specific, looking at one one particular error or area, I should say, whereby um, Turnstone, Turnstone, sorry, he focus on having his testing being identical so from from my understanding if i'm setting a test for my children it means that every test that will be coming will have some sort of similarity whereby sperman his own wasn't like that his own catered for having um if i were to teach like i said before factors the child would be able to answer questions in various levels the child will be able to do um creating creating um specific things from a particular topic and not just being knowledge based 
right? Now, although he would have, Turnstone would have recognized that his studies could not be considered as a test of Sparman, he, he used what he would have found out and he used that to better his, his, um, his theory or his knowledge that he would have gained from studying both his, his, um, his research and what he gained from Sparman's theory. Okay. Okay, thank you, Janet. So these are all the criticism that uh, is already mentioned here, and we have talked about this. Thank you, all the participants who have participated and then invested time in reading this. So I hope you are better able to understand now. So uh, basically, they are no, they are not critical. Uh, they are not criticism, but critical appraisal or critical evaluation to certain theories that has been provided. Every theorist would, because this theory is payments two-factor theory, which is one of the uh, first and important theory of intelligence, which has been developed in the year 1904. And then later on, people uh, when they were trying to understand what intelligence exactly is. Now, apart from this, you will also get to learn one of the recent theory of uh, intelligence that is given by in terms of pandemic. Uh, so what a actually intelligence is so Robert Sternberg has tried to explain what I mean he has given an article he has written an article and he's one of the living legends in uh, when 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 we talk about intelligence so we'll see his theory also but before that I want to study the historical uh, development or with the hist the the theories which we have the older theories of intelligence so here we come to the conclusion of two factors theory along with the critical evaluation by different psychologists or different or different theorists of intelligence so this you'll find and yesterday we also talked about the past model let me quickly revise what we have done yesterday so past model it it uh, it again it consists of three stages so uh, it is uh, you know uh, governed by the frontal lobe that is frontal lobe of the brain and uh, uh, it is uh, the first functional unit so attention and arousal so over here your brain stem your brain stem is responsible the part of the brain which is responsible for attention and arousal is the brain stem so here uh, you pay attention you conceptualize information you encode what exactly when stimulus is present uh, there what exactly you have to do so that that is done at the attention at the or and at the arousal level then second one is at the functional level so if you think that you have to get indulged in a certain activity you plan it right so all those planning the cognitive activities is performed by the frontal lobe uh, the front of the first the the first lobe of our brain it is here situated here then the second one so when you have when you think that okay when you for example yesterday also i give this example that if you want to study for your exam so you're planning you you give this information that you are going to study for or maybe the presentation i asked you to give a presentation on certain topics so your attention you were aroused and you paid attention to what i said and then you made a planning your frontal lobe made a planning that how you are going to prepare the notes are you going to read the handbook or are you going to going to read extra information so that planning was done by the frontal lobe and then the next uh, stage is the occipital, so uh, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobe. All these brain areas, all these lobes were also responsible for simultaneous and successfully uh, getting the information on what you're going to present. So this is what we talked about. And uh, it also, um, I mean, this, uh, this model was also helpful in understanding the different brain areas responsible for certain activities like the cerebral cortex. So what activity is performed by cerebral cortex, like receiving, analyzing, storing information. So we already talked about uh, the fact that temporal lobe is responsible for comprehension, for expression of language. Right now I'm speaking, it is my temporal lobe that is helping me to speak. You are understanding what I'm trying to say. It is the temporal lobe of the brain that is helping us. So all these um, uh, lobes and like the brain areas and uh, the, so this theory was successful. So we can say in such a manner that this theory is successful in providing scientific evidence to what intelligence is. So which part of the brain is performing which activity, it was successful in this manner. So can we have some critical evalu uh, appraisal of this theory who was uh, who had to present critical evaluation? No, exactly. Uh, any particular theories have not given any critical evaluation to this. But yes, uh, we can have some kind of explanation to this uh, to this evaluation. I think Amanda, it was you who had to present on this. Yes, yes, please. Hi, good morning. Um, I am supposed to on Thompson's theory. Uh, which one? Thompson's theory. 
Thomson's theory. Okay, so we already had a lot of discussion on Thomson's theory. You want to still go with that? Up to you, man. Okay. Uh, I do. Okay, just uh, just a quick review on what is your opinion on how critical evaluation has been provided by Thomson. Thomson's theory, also known as the sampling theory, was put forward in 1935. Thompson has argued the intercorrelations between tests are actually a result of common sampling of independent factors. Sampling means the selecting a particular group or sample to represent the entire population. In Thompson's theory, intellectual ability belongs to certain groups. It maintains that cognitive abilities are manifestations not of a single commanding faculty, but of a few main intellectual powers or a group of abilities. Every test samples a certain range of elementary abilities, some with a wide range and some with a narrow range. The degree of correlation between any two tests depends upon the number of units of ability that they have in common. For example, a child who is intelligent in one group of knowledge may not be intelligent in the other group, but he may be equally intelligent in the various subjects of that particular group. We can consider two groups, such as the science group and human group. The subjects belonging to the science group are geology, zoology, biology, botany, chemistry, and physics, whereas in the human group, the subjects are history, political science, economics, sociology, public administration. <laughs> According to Thompson's theory, a child who is intelligent in the science group need not be intelligent in the other groups, such as human groups, but there is a huge possibility that the child may be equally intelligent in the various subjects of the science group, which means that there is a positive correlation between the groups, and there is a little correlation between abilities belonging to other groups. The main view of this theory is that there is much correlation between the abilities belonging to the same group, and there is a little correlation between the abilities belonging to the other group. Another example is that a boy may be good in mathematics but poor in language or vice versa. In related subjects, he does fairly well but fails in unrelated subjects. That's it for my presentation. Okay, okay. Thank you, Amanda. So we'll uh, move on to the critical evaluation that is uh, given on uh, past model. So it, it was Sadna, I guess. Sadna, are you presenting the critical evaluation for pass model? Did you understand the pass model class? I hope we are not uh, we are not running. Avinash ji. Should I Yes, Sadna. Yes, yes. I, I, I did some reading on it, but um, I'm still processing it a little bit. Okay. But anyways, at the basic level, I hope you're able to understand what uh, Spearman's two-factor theory has said and the critical evaluation and the past model also. So they have talked about frontal, parietal, occipital, and then temporal lobe and the areas that are responsible for the different activities. So that's what the past model says, and then we'll have a, we'll listen to some Satna for the critical evaluation. No particular theories have provided, no particular psychologists have provided any critical evaluation, but again, we can think of some uh, ideas. Yes, Satna. Yes. Uh, in order for me to move to the critical approach, I just like to um, quickly um, give an overview back on the uh, class model. Sadna, you're not you. clear. Your voice is not clear. Uh, is she clear to others? It is disturbing. No. no. Maybe you can no. uh, switch. 
Canada and then try speaking. Maybe I think that would um, help with the internet connectivity. Switch on the uh, switch off the camera and then try speaking so that we can have some connectivity. Am I audible? A little better. <laughs> yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, try speaking. Hmm. Good morning, class. Is this better? Okay. Yes, we hear you. So I was just um, saying that uh, in order for me to move to the critical appraisal of the class model, I'd just like to do a brief overview so everyone can understand. I'll be sharing my screen. I have a, a few images to show. Uh, Sadna, you're not audible. Uh, yeah. Could you turn up your, your mic a little, turn up the volume a little? Mm. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Little yes. Better. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So the class theory uh, by, by J.P. Glass, and Kirby in 1994 is a relatively novel theory, and it was um, basically a theory formed from a multidimensional uh, view because um, they used some constructs of um, previous theories from um, Alexander Luria's theory in neuropsychology, uh, cognitive um abilities and information processing. So basically what Alexander Lewis uh, theory in um, or research in neuropsychology was about was these what it was about these three functional units that we can see in the brain. The first functional unit had to do with attention and arousal as you can see um, the brain stem that is uh, painted in, in yellow is responsible for that functional unit. And the second functional unit comprised of two processes, the simultaneous processing and the successive processing. And you can see the blue area, which is the occipital lobe, and the pink area, which is the temporal lobe, is really responsible for the, um, these two processes as well. And the third functional unit, as Miss would have mentioned, is the planning the planning unit where in the it's responsible the brain the part of the brain responsible for that is the frontal lobe as you can see it's painted in green so basically these were the um these were the researches based on um functional units in alexandra luria's work so a past theory adopted from these researches and PASS is an acronym for p is planning a is attention or arousal, S is simultaneous processing, and the other S is successive processing. So basically what they posited was that, let me show you, um, an attention, for example, and this theory is very useful um, to help to diagnose and detect learning abilities in school. So for example, attention is really an arousal. In this part of the brain, if we have various stimuli, then we can be able to um, choose or prioritize our stimuli, uh, which is important in order to ward off distraction. For example, let me give you an, an example in schools. If we are sitting an exam and there's a construction site outside and uh, they are doing some work outside, you'll be having a lot of noise interference while sitting your exam. But in that specific moment, you have to prioritize your stimuli. One of your stimulus is uh, what you see on your exam paper, and the other stimulus is the noise coming from outside. So basically, you have to prioritize that stimulus in that time, and you have to focus on your exam. So that is what basically arousal and attention is about in this particular um, concept. And therefore, a child, for example, in, in, in a school, in a classroom, if, if the teacher finds that the child is easily distracted every couple of seconds, then this concept is basically saying that there's something wrong with the attention and arousal part um, in, in the, of the brain in that child's um, 
in their child's behavior. So basically, this can assist in, in, in knowing if a child has ADHD, for example, attention deficit disorder. So this is one of the uh, models that Magliere and Daz, they, um, they came up with. And there's another example you can see on the screen that if we're looking for the red, when we look at the word red, we automatically assume that it's in the color red. But we, we have to choose and prioritize our attention here now. We see red painted in the color yellow. So we are forced to be attentive to what we are asked to do in this segment. So that's attention, an example of attention. And in terms of planning, in terms of planning, you'll see another case here. And these snapshots were taken from um, uh, uh, a re uh, PowerPoint, actually, by Naglieri himself. So um, it is shared in the chat. You guys can go check it out. But he was saying he used a, a child at the age of five, Jack Jr. And uh, they, gave these, um, they gave these boxes to fill up. For example, in, in the box with A, you call X and O. In the box with B, the child will put double O. In the box with C, he'll put XX. And in the box with D, he'll put O and X. Now, this planning really refers to decision making, strategies, um, being able to set a goal. So when they gave him this, um, this call out, he first did the entire column with A. He started to fill the entire column with A. X and O, X and O, right down. Whereas some other students may fall straight across A, B, C, D, A. This shows that Jack had a strategy. And this is how the students were assessed um, based on their planning abilities. Basically, this theory focuses more on neuropsychological and cognitive assessment. And moving down to an example of successive, I'm sorry, simultaneous processing. Simultaneous processing reinforces integrating the stimuli, each and every stimuli that you have to make a big picture. So for example, if you're reading a comprehension passage, while reading, the stimulus you, you gain from reading and capturing and internalizing, memorizing, and even comprehending that information in order to give an answer. Those are various stimuli coming together. And um, that is what simultaneous processing is about. I'll give another example about simultaneous processing. It's, for example, if you hold a ball in your hand, the ball that you feel and see, you're not just um, dealing with the stimuli of touch, the texture of the ball, but you're also seeing the, the color of the ball. You're also seeing... Um, you, you know, if it has any grooves on it, so that those are various things like coming together to bring a big picture. So that is simultaneous, an example of simultaneous. And another, uh, the last example of successes is, for example, in the classroom, if you tell a child to repeat this sentence, the red, green, the blue with a yellow, right? This was one of the examples Nagalieri used. When they said in the child less than five years, they'll ask them to repeat the sentence. And if they do it well, then they have their success in syntax in place. In a child greater than five years, they'll ask the child, the red, green, the blue with a yellow. But who got green? So they'll, they'll have, the child will have to be able to put these pieces together to give a response. So if they, if they do it and you show, you show sequencing, for example, in your two times table or four times table, you do it with a sequence, right? Two, two, four, two, three, six, two, four, eight. So you do it with a sequence. Once the child is shown to have done that in sequence in chronological order, it therefore means that their successive processing is intact. So this theory is very useful to um, detect learning of disabilities in children. For example, in the successive um, syntax or processing, you can see here a typical example of the child. Their planning was 90%, the simultaneous processing was 93%, his attention was 103 However, when he wrote, look at how he wrote, the successive, the successive processing was not there. Therefore, he had they had developed the theory that, uh, you know, for example, you can diagnose dyslexia like this. 
So this this theory is very very important um, in order to develop or understand learning disabilities in children. And for the the critical appraisal, basically, um, it's more positive than negative because um, the critical appraisal for class theory is that these these uh, functional units are interdependent on each other. They are dependent on each other or interdependent because even when we are planning, we can overlap into um, attention and arousal because we have to um, have a stimulus to attempt to and then we plan. So they, they interlap and overlap with each other. And so therefore, uh, one of the positive things about it is that these functional units are interdependent. They're also very dynamic and useful and it, it gives an ability to help uh, learn about uh, learning disabilities in children. And one of the best things that came out of this model was the fact that, I don't know if we use it in Guyana, but I read that they're using it in schools, maybe the teachers can um, mention after this, um, the Cognitive Assessment System, the CAS. I'm not sure if I have an example here. The CAS, uh, I don't have an example at the moment. But the CAS, the Cognitive Assessment System, is whereby it's a tool, it's a verbal and nonverbal tool where they use to um, test that ability on these different functional units. And, and from that, you'll be able to diagnose if the child has a, um, a learning disability. So um, basically, critically appraisal, critical appraisal for past theory, there are very positive notes on this theory. And so far, I have seen this here as being used in some schools, and it has been doing well. Yes, they would have had some negative comments by different um, theorists, but they um, they were debated and uh, debunked. So, so far, classes theory is very, very useful. And um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope you would have learned. Thank you. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sadna. Yes, so uh, yes, uh, there are very less, you rightly said that there are very less number of critical evaluation to this theory. But uh, yes, uh, it has been, this theory has been successfully applied in various area, be it your cognitive assessment, there's certain, in fact, there's a test also, cognitive assessment system, there's this test, and then it has been, uh, it has been developed on the basis of the past model. And neuropsychological disorders also has been uh, identified and studied. So Alexander Luria, uh, the person has also studied uh, the cognitive system, you know, for, um, uh, through this model. So it was a very uh, deep, I mean, uh, a lot of study has been done through this model. Okay. So uh, yes, that was an excellent thank you, Sadna, for uh, the contribution. So next we can, so this was unit one. In unit one, you have theory of uh, payments to factor theory and the critical evaluation plus pass model and the critical evaluation. This one you'll find in unit one, block one unit. All right. So now we can move to unit two, that is uh, Gardner's uh, theory. Gardner's theory, multiple theory of intelligence by Guilford, Gardner, and Sternberg. So we have already yesterday we have talked about Gardner's theory, multiple Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. I'll just give a quick review: uh, linguistic intelligence, logical, mathematical intelligence, musical, bodily, special, bodily, kinesthetic, special, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, existential. So this was the theory that was uh, identified by Howard Gardner. We'll see to critical evaluation of this theory but uh, and we also talked about sternberg's theory but before that we uh, i wanted to uh, share a video on uh, intelligence by robert robert sternberg himself he himself has talked about what intelligence is when he has developed his theory of uh, trp theory of intelligence but before that i also wanted to talk about guilford's structure of intellect theory that has been given in unit 2 i hope you are able to understand what uh, i hope you are able to understand the structure of unit 2 is it confusing in any manner? No, no, right? Okay, so I just want to share my screen and then we can proceed.
so uh, gilford uh, structure i mean this theory is quite complex but you have to take a little pain in understanding this uh, so yeah when it comes to history the historical perspective of uh, what uh, this theory says so it was developed by jp gilford joy paul gilford in the year 1967 and then uh, he developed this theory by watching his young students in school so he believed that uh, uh, we have a combined uh, uh, we uh, i mean intelligence is not just about analytical abilities but it is something which we hereditarily we have an innate ability also to solve problems so that is what he uh, has uh, he has also i mean he has included in his theory not just the analytical abilities that we learn through uh, that we acquire in our intelligence but the problem solving skills the innate so innateness if you remember the different schools of psychology the innateness perspective school of psychology the nativist or the empiricism they have their own perception on uh, or their own uh, perception regarding what uh, psychology is all about so gilford uh, he also had contributed um, mm, uh, i mean he has believed in the innateness of uh, abilities so his observation has led, led him to the realization that intelligence was not just a global construct but there are uh, different uh, i mean he was uh, it was not just the different types of multiple intelligence that has been mentioned by thurston or gardner but uh, there are there is a criteria there is a structure and then all those structure consist of different different components that that's what he believed so um, he came with three mental abilities so he came with three mental abilities and then uh, he discovered 25 other factors that were involved in this three mental abilities so he termed them as operational content and products so operation the the mental ability that uh, contribute that uh, uh, that governs the operational operation are known as general intelligence or general intellectual process and then this one we can uh, test we can use a test also to understand what are the operational uh, mental abilities of an individual then when he talked about the content the second mental ability so that is uh, areas where we can apply our operation so uh, the areas so the in the operation in the operation component the kind of intelligence that we have or the special all the abilities that we acquire can be applied in the content so so materials uh, presented to the examiners will see will uh, see them in detail and the last one is the product so after applying uh, the concept of operation on content what result how do we react you know so uh, how do we produce or the production so he talks about production also the product so these are the three mental abilities he has talked about so let's understand what are the different components that we have in operation so in operation we have cognition so cognition again no one can deny that he has cognitive activities again all this the ability to understand comprehend discover become aware of information all this are performed by the all this come under the domain of cognitive activities and this is performed by the frontal lobe isn't it yes then memory after cognition so the ability to recall the ability to store and code information uh, retain and then ability to retrieve and recall information for future use so all this come under the domain of memory then divergent production so for divergent production we have it is so divergent production is creativity where you create something you know divergent you use your intelligence to create something something novel something new so this is uh, for to create something you need a divergent the domain that comes is the divergent production and the convergent production is you have so many options and then you solve a problem when you are solving a problem you use convergent production i'm sure you might have read about this yes ma'am yes then the last one is evaluation so when you are solving when you are indulge in certain cognitive activities you sometimes you have to evaluate whether it is correct or incorrect isn't it in our day to day life don't we use all this uh, components in our day to day life cognition memory divergent production convergent and then if we evaluate at the end isn't it whether it's right or not whether you want to today sunday for you and it's a morning whether you want to attend the class is it right or wrong did you didn't you evaluate it Yes, class. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 
okay so next uh, next component is the content so content has four figures uh, first one is the figure so we when we have to when our cognitive activities now can you see the connection between operation and content so all the to understand concept to understand uh, concrete or to uh, to understand things in the environment don't you think your cognitive activities are going to indulge and that yes, one yes 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 the figure components you are going to use uh, visual and the auditory information right now if you are understanding this ppt if you are watching this ppt and uh, understanding what i am trying to say your visual and auditory information are active right now isn't it and if yes, you are looking a book at the same time yes. you are referring a book you are also using your uh, uh, kinesthetic intelligence so this is what uh, it was given under the domain of figures so this is and then next we have symbolic so symbolic if for example if i give you a picture of an apple you would be able to identify it right so it is all your cognitive activities your cognition that that helps you to understand symbols arabic letters numbers all this uh, it helps you now when you for example if i give you a fruit which you have never seen in your life will you be able to identify it no it will take some time to identify no, it still good yeah so when it comes to semantic it is the words the verbal meanings the ideas what exactly it is if i present a new fruit in front of you which you have never seen in your life so that fruit uh, maybe you'll so you're using your semantic content the the components from sim, content uh, factor you're using the semantic intelligence okay this is so somewhat similar to maybe someone a round fruit quite similar to an apple so maybe you will not say it is an apple but quite similar to an apple so using your uh, semantic knowledge your semantic information or semantic intelligence that what exactly it means then uh, gilford has also talked about behavioral so you understand when you understand another people's mental ability and when you understand another's be, uh, behavior or the verbal cues or the you know information regarding people's behavior and action so all these also come under the behavioral content behavioral component of the content intelligence i hope you are getting me what i'm trying to say is it yes. an easy one more relatable huh? right we use this in our day to day life so now where do we use this the product product was where do we use this so uh, product could be again product has also five uh, like it is six so it is six in number so product we use in unit in classes in relation then uh, in system then transformation and then implication we'll see them in detail also so units are just single items of knowledge like for example right now you're using uh, you're reading this ppt so you're using i mean you're using the unit intelligence of your products okay then uh, classes uh, classes would be like when you are able to use two words or two sentences when you have to club for example a young child would use the unit intelligence that what exactly it is 1 2 3 3 if they have to read this line they will read p r o d u c t s but if we as an adult we use uh, uh, when we have to read this word product you would be using the classes intelligence that you combined right and then the relationship so uh, they are a musician they they for example they have given this example that music musician use knowledge of different notes to create harmonies or you know i don't i'm not well in music but anyways when you have to create something or maybe when you have to sing sometime you you mix two or three languages or maybe two or three lines from a song and then you create a new one you uh, so you make a relation when you are able to make a relation between two notes so that over there you are using your in relation intelligence uh the next is system so three or more items forming a whole a song so we can use the same example of a song so relation we are able to when you are able to combine two lines to form a sentence in a music and system would be the whole song the whole melody so musician when they use uh the system they are using they are able to create a whole song and uh, for if they using relation they are just using two three lines to create a new one so if their lyrics when they create lyrics or they when they want to make lyrics they are using the intelligence of relation and system and then they transform it so transformation would be using your previous experience to create something new transformation creating a new idea or a new thought so that is transformation and then implication you imply in your life so uh, that is why yesterday also i mentioned that uh, when you read about a theory try to understand where you are going to use in your day to day life for example some of you might be a teacher so you can apply these theories in your uh, in your school with your students isn't it 
Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, totally, he has identified different factors of intellect, like five into five into six. So, five, there was five units. There five, uh, pro, uh, sorry, five operation, five content, and then six products. So, this is what. And then he multiplied it, and then he provided psychometric approach to this also. And then he came to one fifty uh, factors of intellect. So, this is how it looks. You can have a graphical presentation. Here's a here's a picture of how uh, our intelligence is come. I mean, it is. Uh, formed on the basis of content, operation, and product. Okay, here is a quiz time. A clinical psychologist has to treat a patient with hydrophobia. What operation, content, and product will be involved in this intellectual process? Please think about it. If you understood this theory, you'll be able to answer this question. Class, are you able to understand? Um, Miss Akshay, I think I've watched um, something in relation to this, something back, and you would start as a psychologist. Psychologist, you would start. With something called um, exposure therapy, where you would expose a person to some sounds of water, and then you involve their other senses like touch, and eventually you gradually include them in that. I don't know if I'm right. Uh, you were not audible to me. Were you audible to others? Yes. Who was speaking? Shakira, was it you? No, no. Who spoke just now? You were not able to me. Can you speak once again? Can you hear me now? Yes, Denisa, yes. I was saying that I've watched a video with exposure therapy before. The mm -hmm. first that had certain types of fears, and they started by talking about the the thing that you're scared of, and then you start with gradual exposure, like you touch or you hear the sound of water, and so. Okay, we are, we are not going to talk about the exposure. We had to talk about the different concept that we discussed just now: the operation, the content, and the product. Based on these three, you had to uh, answer. So here is the answer. So psychologists would require to apply the mental operation of cognition, understanding the client's behavior, and divergent, generating different activities, exercises to treat his phobia. So this one we can use from the operation component. And the second one, the psychologist can use the uh, content that would be the behavioral. So how the person is going to behave, that is again from the content uh, component and then the final product and the final uh, from the product uh, component the person would be uh, the psychologist would be transforming the behavior of the individual is it making sense yes miss yeah okay yeah. i'm sure it will. here is in another question you are required to watch the news and give your own input on what do you think about the current hot topic or debate which operation, content, and product will be involved in this intellectual processes? So just think about the operation, the content, and the product. So which from these three components, which uh, which part of these three components will be involved when you talk about a new topic or a new hot debate, or maybe Ukraine and American Ukraine and Russia's war? war what kind of uh, operation and content and product you are going to use? The products. Huh. Critical thinking. Critical thinking, okay. Uh, I think we will use um, visual impression 
like visual stimuli, also the cognitive interpretation, and also how it relates to the socio-economic context and the geopolitical involvement. Okay, let's see to the answer. So yes, uh, you're correct. We are going to use from operation, we are going to use uh, critical thinking, that is evaluation. From content, uh, again, uh, I think it was Samil, you're correct. It is auditory and visual, the news channel, and the product, the implication or the inferences. So what is the implication? If we talk about the uh, Ukraine and Russia's war, uh, we are going to evaluate it critically, and then we, knew, we see the news channel. And then what is the implication of this war in our world, right? So is it making sense now? So you are able to answer. I am sure you are able to also answer and understand the theory also. Yes? Yes, Adno? Hmm. I'm what about uh, cognition in the operations I mentioned? Because we will have to be able to understand and become aware of what's happening. Yes, cognition could be also there. Why not? Cognition should also. So that is why critical thinking is, they have talked about critical thinking. It's See, it's not that this is the only answer, but yes, you can use different. Yes, Amanda, you're right. It's not that this is the only answer, but uh, definitely these are some of the, we have streamlined the answers. Why not? We can use many others. But did you understand the theory of class? If you are able to understand the theory, so this JP game yes, model he gave the three components that is the operation, uh, content, and then the product. So operation also has six components that one we have discussed. Then content, uh, con, uh, what was the second one? I'm forgetting it. Content, right? So even that one has six uh, factors, and then the last one product also has a six factor. Five, six, five, six. It has been, you know, changing. Earlier it was 120, totaling 120, and then later on it was 150. So you can read the current research papers and then you'll find it more. But anyway, you can follow the handbook. So this is uh, all about um, the second unit. If you see at the second unit, that that is Guilford's theory, Gardner's theory, and Sternberg theory. Now I want you all to watch a video by Robert J. Sternberg. And uh, he has talked... Uh, a lot on uh, intelligence. He's a living legend who has contributed recently. Also, we will. I'll share his material on uh, what he has to say on the on what intelligence is in view of the pandemic. So here is a video. I want you all to watch it, and then we'll have a discussion on this. What uh, he has talked about successful successful intelligence. Okay. Hi, my name is Bob Sternberg. I'm a professor of human development at Cornell University. My field is psychology and education. I'm a past president of the American Psychological Association. And I study in my research human intelligence, uh, but I also have five children. So I've had an opportunity to see how it works uh, when they grow up and practice. My theory of intelligence is called the theory of successful intelligence. And basically, successful intelligence is just your ability to figure out what you want to do with your life and to succeed in doing it, uh, given the constraints of the environment in which you live. So successful intelligence is different from IQ in that IQ is a fairly narrow measure that looks primarily at analytical skills and knowledge, uh, your ability to acquire knowledge and apply that knowledge, whereas successful intelligence isn't just about school success. It's really primarily about, as well, life success. I've had several different ways of focusing in my research. One is on teaching. So what I've been interested in is if students have different patterns of abilities. Uh, in the theory, I talk about a successfully intelligent person as someone who's creative in coming up with novel and useful ideas, uh, someone who's analytical in being able to analyze those ideas, 
and someone who's practical, who has common sense, and can make those ideas work in the real world. And so if some kids are more, say, analytical, and some are more creative, and some are more practical, the question I've asked is whether if we teach in ways that better help students to capitalize on or make the most of their strengths, and at the same time, to compensate for or correct for weaknesses, will they do better in school? And I think it's an important question to ask because I know in my own case, I got interested in human intelligence because as a child, I did poorly on IQ tests. My teachers thought I was stupid. My parents thought I was stupid. I thought I was stupid. I did stupid work. My teachers were happy I did stupid work and I was happy they were happy and everyone was pretty happy. So what can happen if all you do is focus on these sort of narrow IQ-like abilities, you can end up missing out in seeing that there are kids who really can do quite a bit more than their IQ or just academic skills would predict. In what we've found across a variety of subject matter areas, like social studies, mathematics, language, art, science, and across grade levels, ranging from about grade four through college, is if you take into account in your teaching that kids learn in different ways, that some are more creative, some are more analytical, some are more practical, you can improve student achievement. So it's not that you have to teach each student in a different way, but rather you say, hey, look, I'll teach in all these different ways at different times, so that at least some of the time I reach each student. So if, for example, you're teaching history, you might do something that's just memorizing uh, historical information, but you also might ask a student to analyze it in historical demands, like what were some of the causes of the start of World War II? Or you might ask the student to be creative and imagine, suppose that Germany and its allies had won World War II, what would the world be like today? Or you might ask them to do something practical, like what are the lessons of World War II for some of the conflicts we're facing in the world today, especially ones that involve genocides? So the idea in any subject matter area is just to vary your teaching style, and it will result in higher achievement by your students. The second thing we do is we try to devise tests that measure these different skills. So when we test, say, in, let's take a different subject matter area, language arts, we might have students analyze a work of literature or, say, compare and contrast two different works of literature. They might, for example, compare the writing styles of Hemingway and Fitzgerald but we can also ask them to do something creative, like to write a poem or a short story or a different ending for a <clears throat> book they read like Tom Sawyer. Or we can ask them to do something practical, like what can you learn from Tom Sawyer in terms of how he persuaded his friends to whitewash the fence for him. So it's important, I think, to teach to these different ways of thinking, and it's also important to test to these different ways of thinking. Because if you don't both teach and test in the same way, what you may end up doing is teaching kids in a variety of ways, but then they learn through narrow testing that it's really only, say, memory that counts. Another thing we're interested in is the idea that kids from different cultural backgrounds or different ethnic group backgrounds may have different patterns of strengths. And indeed, their parents may even have different conceptions of what it means to be smart. For example, in a study we did in California, we found that uh, Caucasian and Asian American parents more emphasized cognitive skills in their conceptions of intelligence, whereas Latino parents more emphasize social skills. But because their teachers' conceptions of intelligence were closer 
to those of the Caucasian and Asian American parents than they were to the conceptions of the Hispanic or Latino parents, those kids, the, the Caucasian kids and the Asian kids did better in school. In other words, if the parents' conception of intelligence matches the teachers, it helps the children do better in school. In another study we found looking at Eskimo kids, that although they didn't do very well on IQ tests or school-based tests, if it came to things like being able to get from one village to another in the frozen tundra in the winter without any apparent landmarks or knowledge about hunting or fishing or gathering, these kids really knew a lot. And so what we discovered is that even though on conventional tests they didn't look very smart, and their teachers often didn't think they were very smart. They had a lot of skills that the teachers just didn't see. And when we taught the kids some geometric concepts using fish rags, which are something that's prevalent, that's common in their environment, the children learn better. So an important thing to take into account as well is that if you teach in ways that take into account the differences in backgrounds of the children in your classes, those children often will do better in school. The last thing I want to mention is that we've applied some of these ideas to college admissions. And we ask the question, say that instead of just looking at tests like the SAT or the ACT, we also assess kids' creative and practical and even wisdom-based abilities. What would happen in the college admissions process? And what we found is that when we took into account creative thinking and practical common sense thinking as well, as well as wisdom, we increased prediction of freshman year academic average. We increased prediction of extracurricular success and success in leadership activities. And we greatly reduced ethnic group differences between children of different ethnic groups. So the conclusion then is it really pays to think of intelligence more broadly, not just as a score on an IQ test or an SAT or an ACT uh, or a GRE, but as really your ability to cope with life and make a success of your life. And when you think in these broader terms and teach more broadly and test more broadly and remember that children of different cultural and ethnic groups may have been socialized in ways that emphasize different kinds of intelligence, student outcomes will be better. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today and I hope you found the information useful. Okay, guys. <laughs> okay, we already have a quotation from Avinash Ji has also provided. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, hmm. so this is what I wanted to talk about the different theories. So we have talked about. Uh, the experiments to factor theory a lot of discussion and and uh, it, it was really wonderful that you also have participated in the discussion talking on the critical evaluation making an effort on what critical evaluation is and so so you also know should know the difference between critical evaluation and criticism they're not criticizing it it's a critical evaluation you know what are the limitations to certain uh, uh, theories that has been provided so you all made an effort to understand that then secondly we talk about past model yesterday we talked about the past model and then it's critical evaluation today we talked about uh, the multiple theory of intelligence Howard Gardner's theory of intelligence uh, the Sternberg's theory of intelligence and today we we listened a video from him from the theorist itself what successful intelligence is and he has provided evidence scientific evidence on how children learn better in different environments and the kind of parenting styles and uh, the the concept of uh, parents and the concept of teachers if there's a correlation children would learn better and then uh, we also talked about the guilford model and then you answered certain questions the case studies uh, 
I mean, two, three questions that, that, that was it anyway, we'll do answer correctly. So this is all about the theories. In unit three, we'll talk about the measurement of intelligence. So measurement of intelligence talks about the different kind of test that help us to measure intelligence. So uh, class, uh, now tell me, where are you? Are you able to absorb? Are you able to understand uh, what I'm trying to say? Or like how? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, I believe that um, one of the reasons that uh, I can only speak for myself, but one of the reasons that I um, yes, sir, uh, is this disturbance I me? Hello. Uh, okay. Please take the background. From where are we getting that background noise? Sounds like nieces in church. Okay. Nessa, can you please uh, lower down the volume? If somebody is into music right now, they're disturbing us. We can have some dance session and music session in some other classes, not today. <laughs> you know, we'll take it in certain, we'll take part in certain activities, why not? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, yes, class, tell me, are we, are you with me? Are we on the same page? Yes. 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 Yes, we are. So according yes. to me, there are five theories and their theories has been discussed and critical evaluation has been provided. And I'm sure you will read about it. And uh, I, I expect questions and I expect discussion in the next class. And uh, definitely provide, uh, give, devote yourself to to read different videos and to read different research papers also. So, like I mentioned, psychology in psychology, we definitely have to read different research because no one, the critical evaluation that has been provided, it's not uh, a one day or thing. Everybody has read and uh, have read different research papers, and then they have they were able to provide critical evaluation to the research. It's not just, okay, I, I want to criticize this, let's criticize. No, it was not that. It was critical evaluation based on research papers. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so that, that's all from unit one and two of block two, intelligence and creativity. So next week, uh, we can talk about measurement of intelligence. So you can we can have questions and uh, I'll take some questions and discussions. Uh, but uh, for uh, intelligence, there are different theories of intelligence, uh, there are different tests of intelligence. So that one I'm going to explain. Uh, but you make sure that you read block one properly. You have a time. I'm not giving you any other activities. Read block one and from block two, read unit one and two. So block three, I'll, I'll see how I'll explain that and then we can proceed to block three and four. Okay. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, so next week, as we know, it is um, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, you know. So I just wanted to ask you how many of you are going to be present next week? Miss, I can be there Saturday, but not Sunday. Miss, hmm? I can be there both days, Saturdays and Sunday. Okay. I'll be here both days. Okay. I'll be only there on Saturday. Miss, I can be both days, but I have to leave at 9.30 for church. Hi, it is, uh, you have a church, right? Yes, mm -hmm. that's a church, I'm heading to church. I will have to attend church on Sunday, so I think I'll be there Saturday and not Sunday, Miss. Okay, not Sunday. Mm -hmm. Only Saturday. So I think we're getting many votes only for Saturday. No, for both the days. Okay, I'll be there both days. I'll be present. Hmm. Miss, I can only be there for Sunday because I am seven days. Okay. Miss, I'll be there for Sunday classes. Okay, we'll see into that. Uh, yes, we'll see I'll how it is going to be. Yes. Uh, Sunday for me, okay. Miss. Okay, I think uh, Ashok sir is here. Sir, are you there? Can you please come to my rescue? <laughs> Good evening, ma'am. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
सर आर यू देर हेलो ओके विल वेट फॉर सर टू सॉर्ट इट आउट okay i think i think we have many votes for both the days so we'll uh, we'll see that it is uh, i mean class will go yes 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 so we have many uh, of am i yes. audible now ha yes yeah, sir uh, we have a question just a second won she uh, he or she is asking uh, I think the person has asked about why it is called as cognitive assessment uh, system. So, one, it is not called as cognitive assessment system, but cognitive assessment system. The uh, the this test there was this test that has been developed, and it has been named as cognitive assessment system, and it was based on the PASS model. It's not co called. So many writers would say that it is uh, the other name of PASS uh, theory, but it's not that. Cognitive assessment system is a test that has been developed on the basis on the theory of PASS model. so that is what that is how our answer to your question to your question yes okay miss thank you for the clarity yes one yes okay uh, sir yes please continue sir ha huh. i think we have votes for both uh, the days yes, sir <laughs> uh, yeah. yes uh, yes ma'am uh, i i am uh, facing some network issues uh, today at my end uh, mm -hmm. i was asking uh, yes, uh, how are the sessions going on session is going really well sir according to me now we can have some answers from other from our students okay they have also participated uh, and uh, yes they right <laughs> yes uh, good morning good morning dear students namaste namaste good morning namaste good morning sir. good morning how are you Morning, morning, sir. Morning. Sir. morning. 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 We we are learning, sir. We are learning to be more interactive. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and if you students have uh, any whatsapp group then you can post it there also so that everyone is aware about this platform so you can use it whenever you want to share your views and your ideas and your opinions with us please use it and uh, after introducing this uh, platform after sharing this platform with you all Mr. Small, you need to mute your mic. Sir, आप ऑडिबल नहीं है आपकी आवाज बहुत कट रही है I think sir's internet is not working properly, so he got stuck. He got froze. Yes. Okay, we'll wait for him to join. Okay, so class, I would also want you to thank um, for the active participation in the class because teaching is a two-way process, and uh, this, as we know, it's a it's a counseling. Um, I mean, it's a counseling session. More, right? So yeah. Miss, I have one concern, and I think this is for any yes. Um There seems to be very slow upload. You know, yesterday's session not uploaded yet. I don't know if there's. Yes. Um, we can have any comments on that. Okay, uploading of the uh, lecture. That's what you're saying. Yes, Miss. I was. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I was asking. Uh, if it isn't possible that we could have that done at a faster rate, so that we yeah, can sure. a day we have sure. that done. So yeah, you can write that in the at feedback. At a faster rate. At, yes. uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm facing some internet issues today. Yes. Uh, what, what did you say? Uh, what at the faster rate? So they want the video, the lecture, to be uploaded on LMS as soon as possible. So yesterday's video has not been uploaded. I guess that's what they are saying. Okay. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Can I ask a question, ma'am, sir, colleagues? Yes, good please. morning. Good I morning. am a part of a group of students who were promised to have that video uploaded, especially for Saturdays, um, at least 72 hours after the presentation. Um, that's because in this group, there's a large group of students who are Seventh-day Adventists and do not attend classes on Sabbaths because of our religious convictions, of course. Um, but in our orientation sessions, we were promised to have the videos from the lectures uploaded in a timely manner. Um, and that has not happened, and we have not been able to access those videos. So I concur with, I think it's June who spoke um, previously. Yes. And so we will be happy if we can have access to those um, lectures. Um, the second thing is, I noticed that the attendance register speaks to those who are excused. I'm assuming that that will include us, the students in this group that are Seventh-day Adventists. However, we do not access the LMS on Sabbath either. And therefore, for those sessions on Saturdays, we will not be able to mark our attendance as excused. Um, that is um, an infringement on what we believe as well. So we do not engage in any academics, and that will include marking the attendance as excused as well. So I would just like to share that with you guys and to, again, reinforce the need for the lectures to be uploaded in a timely fashion. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, kindly define your timing. What do you mean by timing? Within how much hour? Well, um, if I may answer that, in the orientation sessions, we were told at least the latest 72 hours. We have not been able to have any of those videos uploaded in the miscellaneous section of the LMS. Um, so none of the classes we have had, I think our last video was just that final orientation session on the LMS um, that we did before commencement of class. And since then, we have not received any other lectures. Yeah, yeah. The Please, other two uh, lectures are last week, Sunday, yes. lectures up. Sunday and Saturday of last week is uploaded. Those are right. up. 
Already. And I, I think I checked and I did not access them. So could oh, well, you, you gotta check. tell me you where check. again? No, I checked my uh, my miscellaneous folder as of this morning. And You're checking see. in the I wrong was... folder, love. You have to check under the course. There are different folders. The miscellaneous folder would just be for the orientation. However, the folder for the classes is coming directly under the course of the course name of itself. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. And you were asking uh, what 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 we mean by timely. Um, in my opinion, seventy two is 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 too long. If we could have it in twenty four, that would be good. In twenty four hours, if it could be uploaded to the LMS. Thank you. Actually, actually, I think that we are uploading the videos within twenty four hours. Let me let me clarify it. Uh, that uh, uh, presently in India it is evening time seven twenty one. It is seven twenty one p.m. in India. And and when your class will be over, it will be seven thirty p.m. in India. And and uh, uh, myself and my staff uh, after after working for a full day long time. Then, then uh, we we also need to go to our home. So uh, we need at least uh, 24 hours to upload these videos. And after once it is uploaded, it is it is every time at your disposal. You can see it next day after that next day. If say for example today is 10th April. And if the session of 10th April is uploaded by us on 11th April, then you can watch it on 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, whenever you have time. Whenever you have time. So we we also need some breathing space and some time to upload the videos. So uh, please, please uh, uh, cooperate with us. Past two recordings are already uploaded. You can you can watch it from there, and in future also we will be uploading the videos promptly. But we will be taking some time, at least 24 hours or 48 hours. We will be taking some time. So taking a day or two is not a very big deal. It should not create any type of problem for anyone if we are taking a day or two. But so it is already there. I think basic. Yes. Yes. Let me let me let me further make one more request. I am happy. I am very happy that students are so serious about the recording. But let me please clarify it that live sessions are far 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 better than the recording. If you really want to interact with your teacher, then. You must try to attend the live session. Recording for recording. You cannot interact with that recording. You can only watch it. Whenever you have leisure time, you can watch it. You can watch it. Whenever you have time. Recordings you can watch. But live interaction is possible only during the live session. And you learn more. You learn more. By interacting with the team, by interacting with your peer group, by interacting with the other students, you learn more. So please try to attend as much sessions as you can. Is that fine? Is that okay? Yes, sir. I really understand what you're saying very yes. well. But there are issues, right? Some of us have commitments that we can't wriggle out of, right? So that's all we're saying that when we can't, um, you know, we would like we would like to have the recordings. As of early course, as we are providing. But it's not that we don't want to attend uh, classes, or all right. So we are we are, pro we are providing the it's recordings. Just that some of, of us have some of us. Have, some of us have commitments that uh, disallow us being there 
every time. All right? So it's not that we're not making a sacrifice. And then, of course, those who are Seventh-day Adventists, they have a religious obligation. I have a religious obligation, too. I, I worship on Sunday. At my church, I'm the only sign language interpreter. But I have made a compromise, and I'll be there every other Sunday. So it's not that we're being slothful in any way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, dear. Considerate. Yeah, thank you, thank you, dear student. Uh, we respect your religious obligations. We respect, we respect you. We respect your commitment. We respect your job commitments, your professional commitments, your home commitments, your religious commitments.